for having me here today. Uh, first, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Who's familiar with advanced care planning? Okay, that's good. Uh, who feels a little awkward sometimes and maybe is cringing a little bit when they hear about advanced care planning? I might not get hands, but I have a hunch people might be saying maybe. I can say to you that I've been working at Cottage for the last two years doing advanced care planning. And it's been evolving over time. There's a wonderful community organization involved in advanced care planning, but I always feel it's good to be straightforward with people about this is an uncomfortable topic. You know, when we think about our culture, how we have topics about living, about death, sometimes we aren't quick to speak about it and we're intimidated sometimes by our patients. So I can say to you that in the two years that I've been doing this, I've learned pretty quickly uh, when I would go to a holiday party or a happy hour and people are going around the room saying, what do you do? And I'd say, advanced care planning, it's not an icebreaker. I've learned that quickly. And I also have to chuckle um, thinking back to more than a year ago when I first was beginning to see patients in our hospital. And I remember a well-intentioned clinician wanting to introduce me to a patient. This was a patient in her 20s with chronic illness, um, developmentally probably at a social emotional level of 14 or 15 based upon this chronic illness. And so she's sizing me up. And so going in, um, this clinician, again, with good intentions, said, uh, here's Rebecca, uh, she's the will lady. Now that is really hard to recover from, but, um, and I didn't want to be a will lady, but you know, that's how we're learning. What do we call me? What do we call this work? Uh, because it's important work. So today we're gonna to be talking about what is advanced care planning? What are the services happening at Cottage? Talking about ACP, and you're gonna hear me say ACP a lot for advanced care planning. We'll talk about ACP with oncology patients, I'm gonna give you some stories about patients and families we've worked with, and I'm also gonna to touch upon doing ACP with pediatric patients. I've worked the last 14 years in healthcare, particularly in pediatric palliative care and adult palliative care. Uh, and I wanna emphasize as I say palliative care, and then you're hearing me talk about advanced care planning, advanced care planning is applicable for everyone in this room. You might have come here thinking today we're talking about just advanced care planning with our patients. And I have a feeling many of you made a long drive here today. Maybe you drove on 101. I have a hunch some of you have kids. Um, some of you might like cycling. When we think about advanced care planning, it's certainly applicable for our oncology population, but every one of us in this room is vulnerable. We have a 100% mortality rate in this room. And so it's thinking about, we don't know when, we don't know when we could have an acute condition or a chronic condition, but what we can do is plan. And I'd have to say that as we work with families and patients, what I hear the most is the benefit of advanced care planning is for the families. It also gives the patient a chance to have a voice. So those are pieces I'm gonna to touch upon with you today. And my hope from this conversation is we can shift our ideas from associating advanced care planning simply with end of life. You're gonna notice I'm not gonna say end of life wishes often, because again, advanced care planning is applicable to all of us. So there's a national initiative in the last couple years. Many of you might be familiar how Medicare began offering reimbursement for advanced care planning to physicians in 2016. And then there's several hospitals and programs around the country that have really taken it on. Examples are UCSF, UCLA, which has been a great one I've communicated a lot with. Um, we have St. Joseph Health System. Sharp Healthcare in San Diego has a fabulous advanced care planning program and staff. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Conversation Project. That's based out of Cambridge, Mass. And they are a wonderful resource online for what tools do you need to begin a conversation. So I really suggest you look into them. So first I just want to go over what I would say advanced care planning is and really what our team at Cottage is doing. Not only our palliative care team, our oncology team, but really looking at if we're going to message ACP in the Santa Barbara community, we need to do it in a way where it's applicable to everyone. We know everyone's at a different 
chapter in their life, but how do we make this universal sounding? So one of the pieces we've been doing is saying, advanced care planning is for everyone, whether you have a health condition, whether you don't have a health condition. It's thinking about what types of medical care do you want and what wouldn't you want if you were ever in a situation that you couldn't speak for yourself. It's thinking about who would you want that healthcare agent to be? Who would be the person you trust who would follow your wishes? Because you have to think about that with choosing a healthcare agent. There might be somebody, one of your patients or one of you might be saying, oh, it's perfect, it'll be my sister. Well, your sister will say, I love you, but I'm not gonna follow your wishes. I really want you to do A, B, and C. So when we talk about our healthcare agents, I'll talk about that more, but it's really helping our patients and ourselves think about who's the right fit. And then the important piece is documenting advanced care planning, uh, healthcare goals in a document and advanced directive. And then giving that to your primary care physician, to your oncologist, any specialist you might see, and making sure that families have copies. I can say to you that I have many circumstances where people say, oh, I've done an advanced directive, they've come inpatient, and they say, it's at home, it's, it's on my desk, or it's in my safe, no one has access to it. So it's thinking about, how do we make it accessible? We all know where our driver's license is right now. Where's your advanced directive? You go home, it's on your desk, everybody in your family knows, and even better, maybe you've made a copy for everyone in your family so they know what you want. The Institute of Medicine did an interesting study uh, a few years ago. They were looking at how many patients would be interested in having a conversation um, or have had, how would, would like to talk with a physician about their healthcare goals. Notice again, I'm using the word healthcare goals because if we're thinking about everyone in this room, we're thinking about a 20 something, a 35 something, a 57 year old, a 75 year old, if we're always saying end of life wishes, we find a lot of people don't find that's applicable to them. We found healthcare goals has been a really valuable term to use because people say, oh, that could be me, that could be me. So interestingly, if you look at these numbers, about 47% are saying, I'm interested. Uh, we have a lower that are saying, maybe. You know, so maybe some of those people are saying, I'd never thought of doing that before. We have about 16% still considering it, but it's a very small number that are saying no. Part of that might be cultural, um, part of it might be fear about those conversations. So interestingly, I wanted to then look at their data for how many patients have actually had a conversation with their physician. 92% have not. So that's thinking about seeing an oncologist, seeing another specialist, seeing a primary care provider. None of these conversations have come up, yet we know it's inevitable, particularly in the United States where chronic illness is something more people die of. But we haven't had these conversations. So to tell you a little bit just about the clip that Dr. Atul Gawande did, um, I suggest you go back to YouTube and you look it up. Um, but what he focuses on is a patient, a woman who I think was about 34. She was in her, I think, 38th week of pregnancy, been doing healthy, doing well, um, baby was okay, and they discovered that she had a stage four type cancer. She ended up giving birth but she could only use one lung giving birth. Uh, it was a very traumatic situation for her family. The baby lived, um, the mom lived through the labor, and they were doing pretty aggressive treatments. And so Dr. O'Toole Gawande features a conversation with her husband. And her husband talks about how emotional it was to go from being ready to celebrate the life of their new baby to thinking about her mortality uh, and looking at loss in terms of she wouldn't be a mother. She wouldn't necessarily be there to see her child thrive. And as he continues the conversation, Dr. Gawande, with this gentleman, um, her husband, she passed away, um, but she fought. And at, there reached a point where she said to her husband one evening, she said, I just can't do this any longer. And at that point, they did hospice care and she died very peacefully. But the piece they look back at as her husband talks, he says, I wish we had started earlier. 
meaning he had wished they had started sooner talking about what she wanted and what she didn't want. Because we think about some of our oncology patients who many of them may want full treatment right till the end. Many might say, I want comfort care, I want palliative radiation so I can still spend time with my family. But the important piece Dr. Gawande picks up on is it's time to start the conversation earlier than later. And her husband really reinforced that. So as Cottage has been looking at national programs, hearing these stories, we came up with what we were looking at as a, a vision and a mission. We put together a steering committee of about 16 key players in the community, um, everyone from Dr. Cass, our uh, medical director at the oncology center here, the cancer center. Um, we have physicians from Sansom. We have social workers, chaplains involved. We have administration. And we all came together and said, what can we make work in the hospital what we, can we continue to support here in the community? And realizing if you're gonna do advanced care planning, it's better to do it while you're healthy or while you're stable than when you're very sick in the hospital. We all know when we go to see patients and provide care in the hospital at bedside, oftentimes we're lucky if we get 15 minutes. They're fatigued, uh, not feeling well, family's coming in, physical therapy's coming in, you're trying to juggle, where's that time to have the conversation? Beginning the conversation sooner is better. And I wanna emphasize again, advanced care planning is thinking again about what you want and what you don't want. What's meaningful to you? We're not necessarily talking about death. And I think that's a fear as I work with oncology staff is if we introduce advanced care planning, we're telling our patients they're not gonna survive. That's not the case. When we talk about advanced care planning with our cancer patients, this is a tool to empower them in a situation where they have very little control. It's an opportunity for them to have an active voice in their care, to participate, to tell us what they want, and if there is a circumstance they can't speak for themselves, we will have already had that conversation with them knowing what they want and knowing what they wouldn't want. And I want you to think of all of you here in the audience. Think about maybe you have an allergy to a medication. And every time you see your primary care provider or your specialist, you always remind them, yep, I'm allergic to penicillin. Well, when you get treatment, maybe suddenly and you come in, we know not to give you penicillin. And it would be a violation if we did. So I want you to think of that as healthy people in this room. And then I want you to be able to parallel that to some of our oncology patients who tell us, yes, I want CPR, no, I don't want CPR. And thinking about how important it is that we honor those wishes. So as we looked at our populations in Santa Barbara thinking, well, we want everybody to do advanced care planning, everyone 18 and up. So we really found four groups, and that's people who are healthy, um, 18 and up, then it's looking at people who have an early onset condition but are stable. The third group is looking at patients who have a chronic, potentially progressive illness. And the fourth group are those patients we wouldn't be surprised died within the next 18 months. Oftentimes we do our pulsed forms or physician orders for life-sustaining treatment, often with those patients. So in considering who those patients were, what groups they were, we then looked at what services could we provide? What did we need to build? And I have to tell you, in two years, we've built a lot. There have been plenty of um, hiccups along the way, but I think it's made us a better program over time in learning what's needed internally in the hospital to make a program function. The first thing our steering committee did was we invented MyCare. And it's an advanced directive that Santa Barbara County is now using. It's similar to Five Wishes, I imagine some of you have used Five Wishes. So I'd say it's about 75% the same. We've broken down some of the questions in it regarding CPR and life-sustaining treatment. And one of the pieces we've done is we've put in, and we've indicated what is required and what is optional. Because when you use Five Wishes, there's five wishes, it's the first two wishes that are required for it to be an advanced directive. The other wishes are optional. And we found sometimes we're meeting with patients who say, you know, it, it, that, those other pieces, that's not me to talk about whether I want someone praying over me or I want my family coming to see me. I just wanna tell you whether I want CPR or life-sustaining treatments or not. 
so that we look at, let's have those pages in there, particularly for our sickest patients who are filling it out, so that we can say to them, fill these pages, I think it's six through 14 out, get that done. And if you wanna consider those other pieces, turn those in afterwards, but at least we have that information on file. We know who your healthcare agent is, we know whether you want CPR, we know whether you want life-sustaining treatments. So the next thing we did, and I encourage you when you leave here, to look at our website, because we're looking at this as really a population health movement, a community effort, and we want to make it easy in 2017 for people to do this. So this is the website we set up. It has a fillable PDF on it. You save, print it out. One common question comes up I get is, okay, Rebecca, I've finished my advanced directive online. There's no submit button. Well, there's no submit button because in your advanced directive, you need to physically sign it. You need to have two witnesses physically sign it or a notary public. So those are the reasons you can't immediately send it back. Our website also talks about local notaries, who's available, common questions, as well as ACP workshops that we do both in the community and at the hospital for our patients. So again, I want to say to you, you know, what is an advanced directive? As we've gotten this going, it's thinking about, again, what is the message we're sending to people about an advanced directive? When I meet with that 20-something-year-old woman with a chronic disease, who I've been called the will lady to, um, what do I say so she knows more about what is the my care? And one of the ways I explain it is I say, this is a form that tells me and your medical team the types of medical care you want and you don't want, if there's ever a time you can't speak for yourself. And I say, this paper is your voice. This is an opportunity for you to speak out. The other piece I say a lot is, you can change this at any time. There's a fear people have of, ooh, I'm turning it in, it's you know, set in stone, I can never change it. That's not true. I find a lot of our patients we work with as they go through different chapters of their lives, they change it. Maybe their condition has progressed, maybe they're pregnant, um, maybe they're having grandkids, they're thinking about what would I want at this period in my life? What is most important to me? And then I explain the signatures that are required. So the piece I bring up next is who's my healthcare agent? And we say the healthcare agent is the person you choose and document in your advanced directive to be the person to make those choices for you. And again, when I say choices, I want to emphasize they aren't making the choices in that moment that they want. This is a person that your patient has sat down with and said, this is what I want. Are you willing to honor my wishes and follow those? Because again, we have circumstances where people say, you know, I believe in you, I love you, but I can't follow those wishes, but I'll be your healthcare agent. That's not the right fit. One of the other things I wanna bring up that we've learned over time is, and you know, a lot of collaboration nationally, is specifically using the terms healthcare agent or healthcare proxy. Uh, it makes it more clear. You'll notice that we have what's called a non-statutory document versus a statutory document, which is what you fill out with an attorney. Uh, and a non-statutory document uses these two terms, which are allowed by Healthcare Decisions Act of 2000. Keeps it simple, but one of the most important reasons is I found when we first, I first came in to this job, a lot of times in the hospital we're saying, oh, the POA, the power of attorney, oh, that patient's POA will make the decisions. Well, the POA primarily makes financial and legal decisions. People often choose somebody different to make their healthcare decisions. So we've made an effort, even with Epic, our software system, to eliminate POA, that use, and specifically put in healthcare agent. Because that keeps us on task, knowing, am I talking to the right person? The other piece to know is, unless somebody has turned in a document, they don't have a healthcare agent. A healthcare agent has to be documented in this. Doesn't mean they can't have a decision maker, though. If they come into your hospital, one of your oncology patients you're meeting with, and they say, I want my husband to be my decision maker. That's okay, we look at that as a verbally appointed decision maker. Legally, that person can make the decisions, but the catch is they can only do it for that, for that particular admit. You will have to ask that question again at the next admit. That's why it's really valuable to put it down in, a health, um, in an advanced directive, because we don't have to always ask that. 
So just to give you a little more about our Cottage Health ACP services, what we did, we have a patient referral system. You can go into our Cottage One system and our social workers can make a referral. So often our SICU or MICU nurses or our Five South, our oncology group, I get referrals for this is a patient to do a pulse with. This is the patient to do an advanced directive. This is a patient to have a conversation with the family about who the healthcare agent is. And we do individual counseling. And in those sessions, I have a wonderful um, nurse who works with me. Her name is Babetta Didino. Um, her background is hospice care and everything for many years. And she will go into patients' rooms, sit down one by one, and walk them through just the conversation of what's important to them, what's meaningful in their life. And then talking about doing the document, who the agent is. And I want to say to you, it's a process. When we started this program, we thought, oh, it'll take one or two visits, and then we'll have the document, and we'll just scan it right into the system. I think I can safely say we're finding with our oncology patients, with our inpatients, it takes three to five meetings. Part of the time, it's because they're tired. Part of the time, it's where they are emotionally. They may want to talk about it, but they don't necessarily want to sign it at this point. But it, at least it's the beginning. We also offer hospital workshops once a month for an hour and a half. Patients come in, and Babetta walks them through the document, explaining what it is. We also have an employee campaign, because as we think about our community and our patients, we realize if we're not doing advanced care planning, why are we asking our patients to? Because again, we're all vulnerable. We don't know who's gonna be in that accident. We know that the people in our emergency department, none of them want to be there. None of them expect it to be there. So it's really thinking about the what ifs and what can we do to be prepared. So our employees, every member of Cottage's board has completed an advanced directive in the last four months. Every member of our executive management group has completed one. Our ACP steering committee is finishing one. Our development direct, or excuse me, our uh, directors of uh, different programs are finishing it. So we're really looking at from the top down, working on our own advanced directives, and then having all our other employees do them so that it makes more sense when we ask our patients to do it. Everybody does an advanced directive. Part of the reason, uh, or part one way we do that is through an event called the Get It Done Today event. Uh, there's a public organization called the Alliance for Living and Dying Well that once a year at the public library, they bring in facilitators and you can sit down with a facilitator for an hour, go through your document, and you're done. And again, there's a required section and an unrequired. Required section, I remember working with two bioethicists on their advanced directive. And they looked at me and they said, we don't want to go into that feel-good piece. We just want the basics. We just want CPR and life-sustaining treatment done and then the notary to sign it. I said, that's fine. But then we have other tables where the entire family comes in and it's important for them to work through every piece of that document. We remind ourselves every patient, every family is different. So as we think about the patients that we're really serving at Cottage, we're triaging services for our seriously ill patients, which includes in oncology, palliative care, high risk, and then we've specifically started out doing some implementation sites so we could gather data, look at what's helpful, what's not. And I wanna emphasize to you that when we work with our heart attack patients, it's different than how we work with our oncology patients. There's, you know, somebody gave me a good analogy at another conference. They were saying, not everybody fits, or your, my shoes don't necessarily fit your shoes. Or my, did I say that right? Um, but what I'm saying is we're realizing for each team, we have a different size staff. We have different resources, different time, and diagnoses are different. So we've really looked at how can we create a workflow so that it's part of the care plan, but it's at an appropriate time for the patients. And when I say high risk, I want to say to you, high risk could be frequent readmits, but frequently we look at our high risk patients often as our homeless population here in Santa Barbara. We have a lot of homeless people coming in and out, and you're thinking about who is the voice for those people, or how can we give them a voice, particularly if there's distrust in the hospital system. How can we support them? Really more so, how can we empower them? So I want to give you a little information about our palliative care team. 
They have been a wonderful team to work with since last January. Um, we have a few of them here. We have Ellie Melton, our nurse practitioner. We have Lori, one of our nurses. We have Kathy Nelson, our social worker. Um, I don't see Anthony here, who is bereavement and also a clinical psychologist. And Dr. Michael Kearney is the medical director. They have been a fabulous team to work with because I would say one of the key pieces we have learned is every member of the care team mentions advanced care planning. As Babetta, the ACP resource nurse, has worked with patients, she found success rate of completing an advanced directive or a pulse was much higher if Dr. Kearney had mentioned it to the patient from the beginning. The patient said, oh, Dr. Kearney you know, mentioned that you were gonna bring up advanced care planning. That normalized it. Everybody has a different role in how they bring it up. Dr. Kearney doesn't have an hour to sit down, but he can introduce it and say, this will be part of your care plan. Ellie, the nurse practitioner, can mention it when she goes in again. And then we schedule a time for Babetta to meet with that family. And I, just to show you a little bit of our data, in January, 31% of our palliative care patients had an advanced directive or a pulsed. Our goal was 50% keeping in mind that some of our palliative care patients, when we have them, they may not be able to speak for themselves at that point. Now, as I say palliative care, I also want to emphasize, and really am hoping this is understood in this group, is that palliative care is not necessarily end-of-life care. We have palliative care patients who are with us for 10, 15 years. I think of the pediatric patients I worked with who had muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis. Some of those patients I knew for 12 years working with them. Some of our patients who are palliative care here who are oncology patients, we treat them for a duration of time, maybe helping with pain management. But advanced care planning is a key piece with this because we can talk with them about chemo options, about palliative care or palliative radiation options. There's a great way for our palliative care team to work with the oncology team to really design a care plan that works best for the patient and that the patient has given voice to. So in January, we had 31%. That was how many advanced directives and pulse we had in. With the hard work of our palliative care team, as of September, um, we now have 58% of our patients have an advanced directive or a pulsed. So I want you to keep that in mind if you think about doing this with your patients, because it happened quickly. But again, I want to say one of the biggest pieces of it was everyone on the care team talked about it. We normalized it. I want you also to think about the palliative care team and your oncology patients in terms of, with palliative care, we're looking at a variety of different health conditions and where they are in their prognoses. We're looking at a variety of diverse cultures, belief systems, all ages, different understandings of their illness, different points of accepting their illness, such as cancer. And we're also looking at decision-making capacity. Can that person make a decision? And part of our messaging, as I said, is every patient does advanced care planning. It's part of each patient's care plan. And then what we do is we tailor our conversations to that particular patient. If I'm asked or pulled in to do an advanced directive with a patient who's had a uh, knee replacement, that conversation is very different than the conversation I have with the person with pancreatic cancer, stage four. So we've worked with that, and I want to say that none of us, this wasn't that all of us woke up in the morning one day and said, I can do advanced care planning conversations there, Cinch. They aren't. It's learning, and I remind myself that every family teaches us something different about how we have the conversation. But it never means we can't have the conversation. It's just looking at how do we pay attention to this patient's culture, where they're at now with accepting their diagnosis. How can we bring it up? So in terms of the adult oncology patients, we've had some really interesting circumstances as Babetta has been working with them, as Kathy Nelson, our social worker, has been working with them. You know, and it's looking at what are the different types of cancer, what stage are they in. It's looking at what are their fears. And a lot of times we find that the fear of doing an advanced directive is they say, I'm asked to do an advanced directive? What haven't I been told? because we again have sent the perception that advanced care planning means end of life. It's not. So it's thinking, how do we reframe that? 
One way we do that is you're stable now, you're doing well. But we want to keep in mind if there's ever a circumstance you had to come into our emergency department and you couldn't talk for yourself, who would you want to speak for you in that moment? And who would tell us what you want? We never want to just say advanced care planning is simply end of life. So that's where we clarify misconceptions. And I really look at it as a way of empowering patients to have a voice in their care. You know, again, they're thinking about a stage two breast cancer. What are their goals? What do they want in their life? And thinking, how can we adapt our treatment plan to that? And this actually serves as a really valuable way to go into code status, is really talking about goals of care. Sometimes when we immediately go into code status, do you want to be a DNR? We hear our residents say that straight out to some of our patients. That doesn't go over smoothly. It's thinking, how can we rephrase this? How can we refine our conversation skills? And again, I want to say, it takes practice. So in terms of goals of care, this is a piece that our hospital as a whole is going to work on doing. We're going to do an implementation site in our medical intensive care unit where our residents all do goals of care with patients within 36 hours. But our palliative care team is already doing goals of care conversations. And we look at it as everyone with a chronic condition should be doing a goals of care conversation. Really, it's communicating with the patient and family. It's clarifying what goals and priorities they have for their care. And it's developing a plan that fits that patient. And then keeping in mind, maybe the chemo is successful, maybe the radiation or surgery is successful, but always reviewing that care plan. And there will be times when that cancer progresses that we refine our goals. We say, you were at this point in September. Now we're at a different point. Your cancer has changed. Your cancer has metastasized. Let's think again about what's important to you. So I want to say a really good question to ask your patients is, what gives your life meaning? Or what's a good day like for you? A couple of you have heard me tell this story before, but I think about going out to a patient's house with a nurse, Liz Taylor Lindsay, uh, who's a high-risk patient, frequent readmit, uh, older gentleman. She did his vitals, and then I was there to help coach Liz in having an advanced care planning conversation with him. It was part of his care plan. And I remember he hadn't really been that responsive while she did his vitals, not interactive, no affect, no eye contact. But then he, we, we kind of switched the conversation, and we said, you know, Ted, talk to us. What, what's a good day like for you? And I remember him sitting up in his chair and just saying, looking at his watch, actually, it was about 11.45. And he said, well, every day at noon, I get on eBay and I sell antiques. And he points to the bookcase behind him with all his antiques. And what came from that conversation was knowing that for Ted, a meaningful life or a meaningful day was if he could continue this hobby, something he enjoyed. He didn't mind being in the wheelchair, but if he could continue to be him, to do those activities, that was what was important. So do you think this video is going to work? Paul's oncologist tailored his chemo so he could continue working as a neurosurgeon, which initially we thought was totally impossible. When the cancer advanced and Paul shifted from surgery to writing, his palliative care doctor prescribed a stimulant medication so he could be more focused. They asked Paul about his priorities and his worries they asked him what trade-offs he was willing to make. Those conversations are the best way to ensure that your health care matches your values. Paul joked that it's not like that birds and bees talk you have with your parents, where you all get it over with as quickly as possible and then pretend it never happened. You revisit the conversation as things change. You keep saying things out loud. I'm forever grateful because Paul's clinicians felt that their job wasn't to try to give us answers they didn't have or only to try to fix things for us, but to counsel Paul through painful choices when his body was failing, but his will to live wasn't. Later, after Paul died, I received a dozen bouquets of flowers, but I sent just one to Paul's oncologist, because 
She supported his goals, and she helped him weigh his choices. She knew that living means more than just staying alive. A few weeks ago, a patient came into my clinic, a woman dealing with a serious chronic disease. And while we were talking about her life and her health care, she said, I love my palliative care team. They taught me that it's okay to say no. Yeah, I thought, of course it is. But many patients don't feel that. Compassion and Choices did a study where they asked people about their health care preferences. And a lot of people started their answers with the words, well, if I had a choice, if I had a choice. And when I read that if, I understood better why one in four people receives excessive or unwanted medical treatment or watches a family member receive excessive or unwanted medical treatment. It's not because doctors don't get it. We do. We understand the real psychological consequences on patients and their families. The thing is, we deal with them, too. Half of critical care nurses and a quarter of ICU doctors have considered quitting their jobs because of distress over feeling that for some of their patients, they've provided care that didn't fit with the person's values. But doctors can't make sure your wishes are respected until they know what they are. Would you want to be on life support if it offered any chance of longer life? Are you most worried about the quality of that time rather than quantity? Both of those choices are thoughtful and brave. But for all of us, it's our choice. That's true at the end of life and for medical care throughout our lives. If you're pregnant, do you want genetic screening? Is a knee replacement right or not? Do you want to do dialysis in a clinic or at home? The answer is, it depends. What medical care will help you live the way you want to? I hope you remember that question the next time you face a decision in your health care. Remember that you always have a choice. And it is okay to say no to a treatment that's not right for you. So that's a powerful piece. Uh, that is the wife of Paul Calanthe. I think I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. He was a neurosurgeon at Stanford who developed stage four type cancer. And he did pass away, although he had the opportunity to still do some of the work he wanted and that he was passionate about doing before he died. They also had an opportunity to have a child. And they planned his medical care on a way of making sure he still enjoyed quality of life and that they as a family could be together. And as a family, they could meet their own goals. And it makes us think about when we talk about our oncology patients, when we sit down and we talk about their treatment plans, asking that question, what's most meaningful to you? What do you want from this? What can you do for this? And it's sometimes us sitting back, instead of thinking of that treatment protocol, it's thinking, what would work for this family where they're at? And then there's a really great um, approach. It's called REMAP. And it's addressing goals of care. And it's a good tip sheet for you to look through at another time. But it's talking through, how do we have that conversation? If something's not going well for that patient, their status is changing, sitting down with them, talking about it honestly, being prepared that it's going to be emotional, and thinking to ourselves that silence is OK. We don't have to fill the room with chatter when we're uncomfortable. Silence is a way of our patients processing. And then it's mapping out what's important to that patient. OK, they've said family time. They've said their career, a special trip they want to do. How do we make that happen? And how do we align our care plan with that patient's values? And I want to say the plan that's developed as a medical team in collaboration with that patient is a plan that's often revisited. 
And as we talk about code status earlier, by having these goals of care conversations in the beginning of a chronic condition, potentially as it progresses, as the patient declines, we have a way of capturing that information, taking notes on it, making sure we continue to be aware of the framework of what that patient wants and what they don't. And taking a step back ourselves from saying, we must cure, we must cure, because again, optimal care may be making that patient most comfortable, helping them live the life that's most meaningful to them now, not necessarily the one they planned for, but making the best of what they have. And I just want to touch upon hope, because I think a lot of times we think about hope simply being cure. What I've learned in working in pediatric hospice for years, in, and then also working with adults, is hope is relative to each individual. It's really reflecting on what we've had in our past, where we are today, and what we hope for in the future, even though it's not what we expected. And then it's planning for how can we make those things happen that are meaningful to us. Seeing our family, palliative radiation so you're comfortable, uh, so a broad spectrum of goals, but keeping in mind, goal is not always simply medical treatment. It might more so be comfort care, time with the family. Really, again, asking patients, what's a good day like for you? What's a way you want to live, and what's a way you wouldn't want to live? So I want to say, just touch upon, there are some challenges. And people say to me sometimes, well, there's a language barrier. They're a different religion. I can't do that. I haven't had practice. I think that patient is going to survive, so I'm not going to discuss DNR um, status with them. Of course, they should be full code. We've had some patients recently. We've had a 51-year-old with a type of cancer that's curable. She's filled out a post and said, I don't want CPR. Our medical team said, what? But we can help this patient. But she deserves the right to make that choice about if she ever needs CPR, she doesn't want it. And that we need to respect and honor. That's her choice. Decision-making capacity, I only have a few more minutes, so I'm just going to say that one piece that we do, particularly with our late-stage oncology patients, our palliative care patients, sometimes they don't have the decision-making capacity, and that's a time where we're doing the pulse often. We do pulse with a lot of our patients who are certain um, they want a specific type of care or don't. But we do pulse often with the family members who are the legally recognized decision-makers. So I want to touch upon one last piece that might make you shift in your seats a little bit again. But this is pediatric advanced care planning. I want to say to you this is such a valuable tool for working with patients with chronic illness, oncology patients. And I'll tell you a quick story. I worked with a young woman at Memorial Sloan Kettering many years ago. Uh, this is a story her family has said that I'm able to share. She had been pregnant, didn't tell anybody about her pregnancy. Uh, it was discovered three days after she gave birth that she, in fact, had osteosarcoma. It had progressed. She had always associated the back pain with her pregnancy. So she began chemo, and within three months, it had metastasized. What she said to me at the time, I was working as a child life specialist there, what she said to me was, I'm going to continue treatment because I don't want to disappoint anyone in my family. At the time, she was doing palliative radiation, and it was unbearable watching her go from her bed, wheeled down to radiation, and getting on the radiation table. She was in so much pain. I remember the radiation oncologist saying to me, the burden versus benefits, this, this isn't fair to this young woman. So I talked with her one-on-one, -on -one and I said, what do you want? Is there a way for you to tell us what you want? Maybe your family. And I said, what about making a video? And she said, well, what would I do? And I said, you'd be the director. So she chose for every member of her family and close friends to come into her room one by one and to talk about their relationship. And then she would say, now talk to the camera as if I'm not in the room. So she would say how much they loved each other. They would share that with her. And she would again say, talk to the camera. And it was really the beginning therapeutic process of her being able to say goodbye. So she reached a point where she was unconscious. Family wanted to continue treatment. What we chose to do, myself and the psychologist, was show them the 10-minute portion of the video 
that we had Jessica speak to the camera. And in this 10 minutes, which were raw with emotion, Jessica spoke about how she wished God would heal her from her toes to her head, but he couldn't. It was her time to go. She wanted to be at peace. She wanted them to care for her baby, Alexandra, and that she always loved them. And this was powerful because we showed this video to the family, and I'll never forget her mother watching it and saying, we know she wants to be at peace. Let's discontinue treatment. I remember her father saying, you know what, she's going to play softball again next year. She wants treatment. And that was where he was coping. But it was a valuable tool for us in pediatrics to use that as well as other documents like my wishes. It benefits the family, it benefits the child, and the medical team. And it's tough. But we owe that to our patients, too, to listen to them, particularly when they've been very sick, potentially for a long period of time. So I want to just end with one piece of why do we begin these conversations? And many of you may have heard of Dr. Ira Byock, and he has a powerful quote. And he says, I have an advanced directive not because I have a serious illness, but because I have a family. So that's applicable to all of our patients, our oncology patients who are going home, thinking about how is that family coping, and if something changes suddenly, what can they do? And then for every one of you in this room, I imagine you have family or close friends, and it's thinking about what kind of gift could you give to them in a difficult situation to make it easier. So my time is up. I don't know if I have a minute or so for questions. I'm sorry, the change from the five wishes to my care, are you creating it as you go, or is this some you know, on high standard form you're following? Or you Great question. Um, what we did was we used a variety of different forms, including, including Kaiser Permanente, including the California Advanced Directive developed by Dr. Rebecca Sidore at UCSF. We used Five Wishes, and we just put a lot of ideas together. Um, those particular documents had a Creative Commons license, so you're able to use those ideas. We needed it to be at a sixth to eighth grade health literacy level by Joint Commission standards. And I can say to you, this document will always be changing. We'll each year print a new one. We've already learned from our other two printings things that have need to be corrected. But our hope has been that it's clarified sections for people as they go through it. So as an employee at Cottage Hospital, should we now have this My Care document in lieu of the Five Wishes document? Oh, I love that you asked that, because I didn't hit upon that yet. If you have already turned in an advanced directive to your personal medical record, we will honor that. It's just we're solely now distributing the My Care document. But if you have a Five Wishes or a form you filled out with your attorney, provided it was filled out accurately and legally, that's absolutely what will follow. And if you submitted a new one down the line, we're able to document in your medical chart the most recent document, and that's what we would follow. When I admit a patient at Cottage, um, we all ask about advanced directives, and if they don't have one, we offer the um, form. But is there somebody who will come and talk to them one-on-one -on -one, um, to help them get through the form. I can hand it to them, but I don't have the time to explain everything. And where is it, did you say that you work? Orthopedics. Orthopedics, oh, so right here at Cottage. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, you can contact me or Babetta. Um, you can email mycare at sbch.org, or you can make a referral directly through Cottage One, and we can follow up with that patient. Okay. The other question is for my own self. Um, I know we scan everything into the electronic record for advanced directives forms. When I make one out, is there a way for me to get it scanned in without being a patient? Uh, is there a way to get it scanned in without being a patient was your mm -hmm. question? Yeah. You can do one of two things. You can bring it directly to medical records and they'll scan it into your file for you or you can mail it to me. I'll look through it, not read your personal information, but just make sure you've signed it accurately, and then I will take it to medical records for you. Just 
One oh, more. sorry. Hi. Um, sorry, this is too loud. My background is working in an oncology intensive care unit, so when she spoke to 50% of critical care nurses, um, have thought about not staying because of these like moral distress. But my question, maybe I should look at yours first before I ask if I can get a copy of this. Sure. Is there um, something in there to, to address the short-term question? Because I've been in this situation, well, just recently, where the family member has said, well, I know my husband doesn't want, would only want short-term intubation or short-term. And there's a disagreement. Some doctors said, oh, that's only four or five days. And the pulmonologist said, no, that's probably 10 days. And the family is stuck in them, addressing after their, that their wishes, how they're translated, I guess, or? That, it's a tricky one. You know, one thing that we say to our patients is being careful about saying, I want antibiotics only for five days, sometimes because that antibiotic protocol is for 10 days. Uh, so in terms of short-term treatment or being on events, uh, I think one question that we do follow up with is, are you looking for returning to the same quality of life that you were at beforehand? Because you may or may not, or based upon where you are with your condition, if we did resuscitate you, if we did keep you on a vent, you may not still be at a point where you know who you are, um, where you know who your family is. It's a hard talk, um, and I'm happy to speak with you one-on-one -on -one about it. <laughs>